All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome to our first 15 and 15. This is 15 minutes of fun and drama. Um, and today we are talking about cluster learning. Um, and really, I'm just going to give the overview. I think there's nobody who won't already know this, but I am trying to give a few deeper examples on each one so that uh, even if you're real familiar with cluster learning, maybe this will help you just expand um, your understanding in certain areas a, a little bit more. Um, cluster learning is how PSU students practice the habits of mind. We can look at the habits of mind a little bit more at the end of the um, system. Um, and also, I wanted to let you know that cluster learning is not um, the same thing as clusters. You know, we do have clusters at Plymouth State, and uh, that would be a whole different presentation. Cluster learning is really the pedagogy that powers the cluster learning initiative, and it can happen inside clusters, but it mostly happens inside classes. Um, so let's take a look. Um, Cluster learning has three parts, interdisciplinarity, project-based learning, and open education. And uh, we will be sharing a recording of this, um, plus a handout that will walk you through this a little bit more. So I'm not gonna read all of the stuff that we are gonna hit on, but I wanted to talk a little bit about each area um, to highlight some of the stuff that I think is maybe um, not as obvious on the, on the front end. So. First of all, when we're talking about interdisciplinarity, I think one of the things that's most important um, about interdisciplinarity from cluster learning, it's not so much that we work across fields because we've all been doing that for a really long time in lots of different areas. One of the bigger issues um, as we head into cluster learning is really how we talk with our students about interdisciplinarity and even disciplinarity. Um, so the idea here is not just that we do interdisciplinary work, but that we highlight it and make it visible to our students. So um, all of us here are probably very uh, familiar with what a discipline is, but I will tell you mostly our students are not. Um, they know about subject areas and they know about majors and they don't always even know the word discipline. Um, this is clear to me when I teach intro to interdisciplinary studies. And uh, we ask, what is a discipline? And sometimes it, they really don't even know what qualifies. Um, so one of the ways that we talk about it in interdisciplinary studies, which I think is, is helpful, is to think about academic fields of study, these different disciplines that we might have, like math or English or French, um, as a series of fruits. And interdisciplinarity is when we put all of those fruits into a blender and we make a fruit smoothie and we create something new. An example of this might be when we take some English and some social work uh, and some philosophy and we blend these things together and we might come up with something uh, that looks like women's studies. Um, Multidisciplinarity is a little bit different. It's less of making a fruit smoothie. Oh, I'm sorry. My child is FaceTiming me. Goodbye. <laughs> there you go. Just one of probably the nine times she'll FaceTime me during these 15 minutes. Um, so uh, multidisciplinarity is more like a fruit bowl where instead of creating something new out of those disciplines, um, we allow the fruits to stay as they are. Um, so unlike women's studies, which is a whole new field that emerges, uh, multidisciplinarity might be when, for example, you have some engineers who are collaborating with some artists on a project, and that's a multidisciplinary project. Um, so those people aren't actually trying to create a new discipline, but they're using their disciplines um, to do something. So lots of our um, uh, TWP courses, for example, might bring in stuff from multiple disciplines and function that way. Uh, transdisciplinarity, we usually refer to, because the world, in case you don't realize this, the world is not organized the same way that the university is around disciplines. Um, so transdisciplinarity is usually when we take the academic disciplines of the academy and we think of how they can relate to the world outside. We sort of transcend disciplinary boundaries using disciplinary knowledge but moving into um, a world where not everything is organized around disciplines. So what's most helpful in cluster learning is not just doing this kind of work, which we do, but talking about this kind of stuff. And one of the ways we can talk about it is by helping students understand that disciplines are not just 
um, subject areas, right? So that's the content of a discipline. Um, so for example, in English, um, our content focused on things like um, grammar, on literature, on genre, right? All that stuff that we used to talk about when we would look at um, uh, Shakespeare, for example. Uh, but that's not the only part of English. We also have methods and epistemologies. So very quickly, methods are how you do the work in your discipline. And if you've taken, for example, an English class and a math class before, you know that the way that you work is very different in both of those two areas. Even, for example, in biology and chemistry, which are two sciences, you have different methods that you might use. The most obvious ones uh, are whether your methods are quantitative or qualitative. But within that, there are still all sorts of different methods that you can use to do the work. Um, and finally, epistemologies, which is a very hard work for every word for everyone, including faculty, but it really just means how you understand the world. So a good example of this is uh, if you think about what counts as true in a physics class, um, I would guess that things that are true in a physics class have to obey the laws of physics, right? Um, you, you can observe something and you can see whether something is true, uh, whether the formula works, uh, whether the egg falls, right? Um, but that's different than how we calculate truth in a field like history, right? When we're determining um, what's tr what truly happened in the past or a field like English, when you say, what's the real reading of this poem? Um, so the definition of what counts as real or true is going to be different according to your disciplines. So in cluster learning, we don't just want to do interdisciplinary work. We want to occasionally have conversations about what a discipline is, about what methods we're using, about what our worldview is, um, and ask our students uh, to get involved in those conversations. Um, and I'll lastly point out, uh, this is a great quote from Kathy Davidson, but um, nothing about interdisciplinarity really asks us to get rid of disciplines. So um, especially when you really immerse yourself in the field of interdisciplinary studies, um, there's a lot of reverence there for the disciplines. So the idea is to use the disciplines to do even more things than the disciplines do on their own. Um, but it really never is about um, ignoring the methods, epistemologies, and content of the disciplines. Those things become very central in doing interdisciplinary work. Um, next up, we have project-based learning. And the biggest piece of project-based learning um, is really understanding the difference between project-based and project-oriented. So lots of us have done projects all through the years, but project-based learning, which is a a whole field unto itself that I just started learning about when PSU went in this direction. Um, it's called PBL by practitioners. Um, and the main difference with PBL versus like just doing projects and don't get me wrong, doing projects is awesome. Like do them all the time, do them however you want. It's great. But when you really want to embark on a PBL type project, um, the real difference is that you're doing it as a main meal rather than a dessert. And a way of thinking about that is that instead of um, learning the content and then doing a project to apply it, um, you are actually learning the content through the project. So that means that the project um, and the learning is the main meal and the project is not just a dessert that happens after the main learning. This is absolutely the philosophy around which tackling a wicked problem is built, right? Um, you're not gonna learn all about water and then go do a project, right? Students are gonna do a project and they're gonna learn about watersheds and water issues and um, all of that stuff through the work that they do in the project. Um, one way of thinking about this a little bit is sort of like the way you learn in a video game, right? Most people don't sit and read the whole manual of how to do the video game before they play. They play and learn how to do it as they go. And that's the kind of project that we do um, in project-based learning. And the Buck Institute and other places that do lots of work with project-based learning, um, they've set out this definition and there are a whole bunch of, of things loaded into this definition. It looks really simple, but every word here 
maps out to a larger uh, concept of project-based learning, which will be in the handout that I will talk about at the very end of this session. Um, but you can see there's an idea of like doing a project over time, an idea of the project being authentic, right? You're not playing at learning something, you're actually engaging in something that's real. Um, and uh, if you want to, you can take a deeper dive into the sort of, I think it's six um, parameters of, of PBL that some of these institutes have, have put out. But if you keep in mind that main meal versus de dessert thing, uh, you'll really have the gist. Uh, finally, open education is the third wing of cluster learning. Um, and really the idea of open education is that um, open provides both access to knowledge and access to knowledge creation for our learners. Um, and I'm gonna talk about that in three areas really briefly, open access, OER, and open pedagogy. So open access is probably the least important for cluster learning because it's really more about research. And in some ways that's more about the research that our faculty are doing, but it can apply uh, to our students as well. But open access is the idea um, that if you are doing research, your research will have the most impact if the public can access it. So it means trying to move away from putting things into high cost or paywall journals and instead move things um, more into the public sphere. It doesn't mean relaxing peer review or anything like that. It just means making our scholarship more accessible. But we can think of this with students as well. If your students do some great research on climate change, where is that research going so that the public can really make use of it? Um, so that's the idea of open access to research. More central to cluster learning um, are, first of all, open educational resources, which most folks at Plymouth have heard about by now. These are not just free materials. There's lots of free stuff on the internet. Free stuff on the internet is great. I was gonna say is always great. Not always great, but sometimes great. Um, but OER is different than free stuff because OER is free, but it's also openly licensed, usually with a Creative Commons license. That means you are definitely free to use it. You can also download it, you can upload it, you can sometimes change it around. Um, so it's not just textbooks, it's all kinds of things as you can see on this list. And it usually comes with the permissions to do all sorts of things, including revise that material a little bit so you can really customize it for your learners. Um, I will point out that we have a new OER resolution that requires um, all Plymouth State faculty to consider OER for their courses if it's pedagogically appropriate. So I do encourage you, if you haven't looked into OER for your class, to make sure you're reaching out to the CoLab or the library or folks in your um, academic unit for some help, and we can assist you in finding some open resources if you think they might be worth reviewing. And then finally, open pedagogy, um, which is really not just access to knowledge, right? So it's making sure your students um, with accessibility have access to everything that you're doing. It means using OER so your students can afford uh, the stuff that you need to assign in your classes. But it also means finding ways through your teaching to help students become contributors, contributors to their field and to the knowledge commons um, and giving them agency in their own work. So this can be done in a whole host of different ways. Um, but the idea is here is that we don't just want students to be to have access to stuff that we sort of download into their heads and that old banking model of education. Um, we also want to really empower them to feel like scholars and professionals so that um, as they're learning, they are also sharing their perspectives and their ideas right from the beginning, even before they're experts. Um, so that's open pedagogy. And really, if you think about these things, um, they really correlate beautifully to the habits of mind. Purposeful communication, I think, across all three of uh, interdisciplinarity, project-based learning, and open education. But think about these other ones, self-regulated learning. In so many ways, that's about open education. That's about the agency for students to feel like they are part of a, a knowledge community, right? They're not just um, vessels to be filled up. Um, problem solving is so much a part of, of project-based learning. It's one of the core things is that there's an authentic and complex challenge or problem at the core of the project. And then integrated perspectives, which is really another way of talking about um, integrated and interdisciplinary perspectives. 
So the idea here is that um, cluster learning is not something that we invented. Um, it's something that we looked at our general education program, now our home program. Um, we, we looked at our strengths at Plymouth State and high impact practices and our commitment to serving learners. Um, and we tried to name uh, what it is that we do. And cluster learning is the name that we gave that approach. Uh, the final statement I will make is that not everybody is doing project-based learning, open education and interdisciplinarity at every second and every course. But the idea is most courses you teach probably interact in some way with cluster learning. And the benefit we get is that if you mention that and make it visible to students, students will be more likely to notice these patterns in their courses and to really feel like Plymouth State has a, um, a coherent approach to getting them engaged in their educations. 15 and 15 aims to end on time. So with that, I bring us to our conclusion. Uh, Martha's put in the chat a place where you can see a handout, um, a, a web page actually on cluster learning. We're happy to feature your, your con contributions there. So send them over to us if you wanna be featured in the showcase at the bottom. Um, and you can also see the 15 and 15 gallery there that will be built up over this month. Um, so with that, I'm gonna end recording and Martha and I will stick around in case anybody has any questions. I will end recording if I can find the recording.